Welcome to the Writer's Block Podcast. I'm writer Polly Roberts, and every episode I will be in conversation with another Cornwall-based writer, discussing process, why we write, and the part Cornwall plays in our work. I hope you find some wisdom and inspiration in what you hear. The Writer's Block is the Creative Writing Centre for Cornwall. With innovation and creativity at our heart, we offer both a place to write and a unique approach to developing confidence and skills in writing for everyone. Patrick Gale is a novelist living near Land's End. His 17th novel, Mother's Boy, has just been released in March 2022. In 2017, Patrick was screenwriter for the BBC drama Man in an Orange Shirt. Patrick is artistic director of the North Cornwall Book Festival and patron of Penzance Literary Festival and the Charles Causley Trust. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, Patrick, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, Polly. <laughs> it's so lovely to have you here. And we, we have just been talking about your um, skill at online talks and online systems already. So that's a new strand to your writer's bow, is it now? Uh, well, I'm a typical Aquarian. I love new technologies. So, uh-huh. um, even though I still write my novels in ink, I do embrace all these other platforms. <laughs> so you still write every novel in ink first, do you? Oh, God, yes. Yes. Wow. And I, I, I'm, I'm quite a proselytizer for the benefits of it. I, um, I used to drive my students mad back in the day when I regularly taught for Arvon by insisting on one inky day of the course. <laughs> they had to have an inky day. And they'd all say, oh, my wrist hurts. And the, but at the oh, end wow. of the day, they would all admit, actually, they'd done really good work. Oh, that's so, so interesting, yeah. isn't it? It, it is a work. completely different thing. I, I'd always been writing longhand first Uh, yeah every single draft of a novel I've written has been longhand first and then something weird has happened recently where I've started finding I can flow easier going straight to the laptop and it's so weird I don't trust that word easier I immediately think oh this is facility creeping in because I'm a very fast typist yeah so I can I can type believably you know reams of stuff and it'll just be crap (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's my worry whereas when I, when there's something about the pen in the hand that acts like a break it, it means the words come at a, a pace a little bit slower than, than oh, thought that's and so I interesting but also crucially I like to see my crossings out mm. because I often change my mind or I find I've gone off down a rabbit hole that I didn't mean to go down and yeah. it's like when you were being taught sums when you were little and you couldn't get long division right and the teacher would always say show your work <laughs> so that they could see where you'd gone wrong and it, it's the same with I think we should always show our workings when we're writing yeah but right there we go. it's actually it's yeah. quite pleasing visually now now that you're saying I'm imagining these pages with with their lines and their crossings out and their the page after that. page crossed <laughs> out <laughs> yeah well what I tend to end up with his little little circles and a series of arrows, and it'll say sort of move this paragraph to you. Know, it's it's like nineteenth century oh, cut and paste. Move this paragraph to two pages <laughs> later. <laughs> so, did, do you do the first edit on those handwritten as well, or or do you type up first? And yeah, then yes. Well, I try to avoid doing too much rewriting as I go along. Right. So I try to get a whole draft down in ink, and then wow. I will have a, a, a several weeks of cursing as I fail to read my own handwriting. And I, I, I type it up and then I print it out, but with really big spacing. And I would then work in ink again oh, on the printout. Wow. So I think all the really creative work is done with a pen. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's it's totally different when I do screenplays, though, because screenplay writing and script writing for theatre, there's such a heavy load of industry layouts involved that it would drive you mad if you tried doing it yes, in ink. You, okay. you, you, it really helps having that software to pop the to words be, yeah. in the right place but also it stops you writing too much because usually right. when you're working certainly when you're writing for television there's always a really sharp number of minutes that you're allowed yeah and and you you need a break in the shape of um is there one you prefer because yeah. i know i read somewhere you can correct me if i'm wrong that at first you had wanted to be a script writer and then you'd moved into... Well, I wanted to be an actor, first <laughs> and foremost. So the theatre is my first love. Um, okay. And I'm having a very exciting time at the moment because I'm working on 
two different theatre projects. Um, not as an actor, but 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 you know, though I'd love to get involved. Um, one of them's a musical based on my TV drama, Man in the Orange Shirt. Right. And the other is a an original theatre piece, but developed from my novel, Take Nothing With You. Right. Um, oh, how exciting. And, they, and I, I'm really enjoying the collaborative aspect of that. and But also the fun of working with a songwriter and the, the process. I've, I've gradually realised that if I'm really proud of a scene, I mustn't show it to the composer because he just turns <laughs> it into a song and I lose the scene. You know, my best speech will get put into a song no. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm learning now to write you know, like when you were not not wanting your neighbours to copy you in a school quiz oh, that's I, I kind of, so funny Keep I have a metaphorical private. elbow around my work <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so you are but it is really collaborative you're kind of constantly in contact with the others working the musical it's very collaborative yes oh. um and and the, take nothing with you the, the play will be as well because that's um I'm working with this a uh, fantastic young director from Bristol, Jesse Jones, who's a great, is very collaborative and is a great believer in workshopping. So yeah. he and I initially will workshop the shape of the play. And then wow. um, because it's about music, and we're really keen to have all the actors playing instruments on stage, well, they're going to have a whole week of music workshops oh, wow. based on on, on what we've done so far. So and I, so at the end of all of that, I will finally be allowed to sit down and write a script. But, okay. but it, we have to get it all into shape first. And you like that because part of being a novelist is it. being so on your own all the time and, and having I only know, you to drive it. I know. And actually being a novelist is all about control, isn't it? You yes. Can have an un- it, yes. You have total control of your That's little world it. and you have an unlimited budget and you can yeah. have as many characters <laughs> as you like. And, I mean, and that that's the, the, the soul-destroying part of um, writing for screen, especially, yeah. because there's so much money involved. You've got people leaning over your shoulder all the time saying, oh, no, we can't have the plane crash. No, no, we can't have that many characters. And there are these restraints all the time. But I I really enjoy that constant feedback mm. as a change from writing a novel. Yeah. Writing a novel is wonderful, but it's a deeply, deeply neurotic process. Yes. In fact, I, I, I've come to think of it as a willed nervous breakdown. <laughs> so I know, oh, God, it's coming up, like this black cloud, the next book, and I have to will myself into this... Wow. This retreat, in a way, and and become more and more obsessed by the subject and the character. And do you, do you find that kind of um, neuroses that that getting sucked in doesn't drop until you finish the the book? No, it doesn't drop. And once you start, it's like an unstoppable process. Yes. And and I've learnt. I think I think a part of becoming a writer is you have to develop quite a lot of self knowledge. Yeah. Um, because yeah. you are pri- your primary source of yeah. everything. And I. I've learnt to recognise that if I try to interrupt the process, it just makes me get very ratty and mm. depressed and weird. And, you know, some some days the the only cure is just to sit in an armchair with your notebook and get on and with it. And just keep going. Um, I so yeah. agree with you on this because I, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that in, in writing, choosing to write a long piece in particular, for me, I've mm. always gone towards the novel and people are like, why don't you just write a short story? And it's like, hmm... No, I've got a novel there. But it's that it's the it's something is about the gaining control. And I think there is also that thing that you say very true of you oneself being the resource. And I know for me that it's a very self absorbed time when I'm writing where I'm I'm really trying to delve into something that feels out of my control and gain control over it through the process of writing the novel. That the yeah, brings really true, but also don't you find there's an element of um, loss of self? Yes. At least for me, that that's the big kind of turn on of writing fiction is the loss of myself. I like going inside these other people and yeah. kind of possessing them almost and losing myself. And when I'm rewriting, I I tend to cut out things which I feel are too me. Oh, if if I feel I'm showing too much, I try to cut that out. What, um, why is that? What What's the feeling for you of not wanting to have those parts in it? I think I think it's more. It's a kind of accuracy mm. and a, a purity yeah. thing. Um, I don't know. I've never. There, there are wonderful writers who I I respect deeply. Who are I think of as stylists, 
um, and they're the writers who you never forget that they are their voices in your head. Yeah. You never forget because they won't let you forget. And it's not just that they write about themselves; it's that their particular voice is very, very them. Yeah. So you know, writers like Will Self, Jeanette Winterson, yeah, you, you hear their voice all the time. Whereas, I don't know, Sarah Waters, for instance, mm. clearly works really hard, and Kazuo Ishiguro as well, at, at removing herself. Mm. It's almost like a, dec- a decorum thing in the writing. Mm. Um, and I'm sure people who know them well recognise bits of them in what they write, but it's it's not about them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the style, the, the, there is a style, the style is very... Uh, glassy yeah it doesn't get in the way I I always say the thing my dream when I'm writing fiction is that the reader will forget they're holding a book yeah I I, I don't I cut out anything that might make them remember their reading yeah and I I think your books really do that they're so evocative and and such vivid worlds and but it's interesting to me because you have developed over time you've started dealing with themes that are close to home for you. And I know a couple of your books are, are close to autobiographical and some of the stuff that happens, but you've made that yeah. choice to... Yes, yeah. it was a conscious decision. I think when I was about to hit 40, I I had a sort of Proustian moment and realised, oh, I've lived enough now. <laughs> My larder is pretty well stocked. Um, and I don't need to make things up necessarily. Mm. I can at least... You, you shamelessly use bits from my life as raw material. Yeah. Um, and certainly, God, my poor family, once I started writing about them, I mean, that that is a very well-stocked larder. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, it's funny that my, my sister, he, very, it's very kind. You know, she reads everything I write, but she, she says she does it with a certain trepidation. Mm. She's never quite sure what I'm going right. to put in there. And I do always try really hard to respect her privacy and my brother's privacy and not to put them in. Yeah, um, yeah that's a I difficult think, element, yeah. isn't it? That the making use of that larder and really mining yourself and at the same time, yeah, that consideration for everyone else that's naturally going to come into it then. And yeah. how brilliant if they're generous to yes, it. Yes, I mean, dead, de- I think dead, rel- dead relatives are a fair game. <laughs> um, Just go straight there. <laughs> It's funny. I'm I'm working. The novel I'm going to write next I, is is about my mother and my grandmother okay. who are both dead, but there is an aunt who is still alive, and a, a guilty part of me is thinking, oh, maybe if I wait a couple more years, <laughs> and I can really go for it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. No, that's really um, interesting. I'm I'm so impressed that you've already got another book on the go. I wonder. Well, two things really. I'm wondering how long does it normally take you to write. A novel and yeah do you nearly always instantly have another one up your sleeve when you finish with oh one? god you know i'm like heathrow airport at seven in the morning that this is always a holding pattern of projects kind of i mean i'd be really worried if i looked up and there was nothing there wow. um so yeah then the the book i've just published and, and the next book have both been hovering for a while okay. um and I've been, I've been putting the, the next book I know is about my mother and my grandmother, but it, it's still in a formless state, yeah. and I, I've got to wrestle it into a shape in my head before I can I can start uh, work on it properly. And I often find actually that the best thing to do is is research. Mm. So I, I need to know better the two cities where it's set. Mm. Um, so I'll spend. I'm going to spend time in the course of this book tour I'm on at the moment. I'll I'll take time out to go and spend a few days in Liverpool and spend a few days in Wakefield and mm. just just walk the streets that my ancestors walked and you know, get a feel for the place. And that often place often gets my juices flowing. It right. helps me find my way in. So that's often where you begin. Yes. Yes, it's 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 curiously basic, but I, I think a sense of place is so important, not just in an evocative way, but because if you're writing about people who lived in a certain place, that place will have shaped them. Yeah, that's how. So I, I wrote a novel set in Pendeen of all places, mm. and I just spent hours and hours walking around Pendeen and thinking, well, if I'd grown up here, how would I, how would I be? Yeah. 
how would I differ? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, it's really interesting to think of place that deeply in terms of actually you could just go around the corner and it will completely shape a, a different person, a different life. And Totally, yeah. yes. And I think especially with historical fiction, this is mm. even more the case because you're writing in a period when people didn't travel so much. So in my most recent novel set in the early 20th century when people in Cornwall, I mean, to go into Devon was a big deal. Yeah. Um, and and if you were more than a few hours away on a train, you, know, you got homesick. It yes. was, it, it's, it's very different now when we, we travel so readily. Yeah, it's, that's really interesting, isn't it? And, and that thing about writing historical fiction, so your your latest book, the literally just published in March, this month, this month. Yes, um, yes, first of <laughs> Mother's <yeah>. Boy. <laughs> um, that is a historical fiction book again. And and so do you, how do you feel, like, how do you... you feel the confidence to jump between historical fiction and other fi- like yeah it's so interesting well in my head it's no different mm. it's just a novel and the discipline is the same in that what I'm trying to do is tell a believable story and honor the material kind of be accurate mm. I, I always think of accuracy rather than invention when I'm writing I'm just trying to be accurate and um, if you, of course, if it's historical and it's about real people, there's a lot more research. So for yeah. Mother's Boy, I, it, it was basically like researching a, a biography of Charles Causley's early life. Um, right. I had to know everything I could know before I could begin to shape the fiction around right. it. Um, but I'm very male. I think I'm. It's a there's a very gendered thing here. I think I am quite male in my approach, in that I. I don't feel secure in a project until I know all the facts. Oh, so Whereas I know Helen Dunmore always said when writing historical fiction, she would write the story first and then do the research because she said then you knew what you needed to find out. Right. Um, but for me, I, I just find so often it's while I'm researching that ideas come to me or that I stumble on yes. some little detail that really makes a, a bit of the story glow like with this with Charles Caldsley story I I knew I wanted to write a chapter about his early boyhood and his relationship with his father because I knew his father died when he was very very young of yeah. TB and it was only when researching TB and domestic TB care in the early 20th century I came across this little detail of a thing called a blue henry which was a little blue bo- blue glass bottle which tuberculosis patients would carry in their pocket and it was a portable Mm. spittoon quite simply with a little silver lid Uh, but somehow I just thought actually as a five-year-old boy if your dad kept producing one of those from his pocket you'd be fascinated and you'd Mm. want to hold it and you'd want to click the lid up and down and that really helped me Mm. Um, and I wouldn't have had that detail if I'd written the chapter first and then gone looking yeah that's Um, so interesting I I, I'm curious about whether that process is just always the same for you because you're reminding me that I, one of my first well I think it was the first novel I wrote very much came from a point of research it had a lot of science in it and nature mm. facts and it was about reading about nature and all of these facts and all this science that I got so excited my imagination was just going wild and it was like I've got to put all of this into something whereas the later things that I've written more recently it kind of surprises me that they've come completely out of the imagination instead but is it always the same for you research kind of starts first often yes Mm -hmm. I mean if I'm writing short fiction that's different because often there's a discipline there you're you're told oh you if it's say for Radio 4 they the story is really short um so you right from the off you know you've got to come up with an idea that will fit a tiny space and yet be emotionally satisfying and so that's unlikely to be something that needs lots and lots of research. Yeah. Um, it's a funny one, though, because I, I, even with my non-historical fiction, I still do research, partly because I've never had a grown-up job. So <laughs> I often end up researching the jobs that the characters do. I need to know more about them. Oh, so I wrote a novel called The Whole Day Through, where the hero was um, a venereologist. Um, and I suddenly remembered I used to sing in a choir next door to this guy who worked in a, one of the London clap clinics. So I <clears throat> rather surprised him by saying that if I send you a train ticket, um, will you come and stay for a long weekend and just talk me through a day in the life of a clap <laughs> wow. clinic? 
And he said, oh, yes, I can do that and I can bring you photographs too. It was amazing. Wow, um, yeah. But but that's typical because because to make that character come to life, it, it wasn't enough just to say he is a venereologist. I, I really had to know gory details. Mm, um, and your characters really, they do feel so embodied. It really does feel like entering into someone else's eyes. What you were saying about just the details that came to your mind, thinking about Charles Causley being little, they're not the details I would have observed or been able to think up. So it makes it so real. And... Uh, how do you walk around with all of these, I want to say hundreds, maybe even thousands of characters that you've invented over time? Oh, I'd let them go. I mean, my head is a very noisy place anyway. Um, and I, as I say, each each novel is, is like a, a sort of slow motion, willed, nervous breakdown. <laughs> um, you, you, It's a necessary process. I, I, well, for me, at least, I have yeah. to... Um, sink into those characters and they have to become more real to me than my friends yeah. and um, it's bad luck on the friends really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's re- it's really all absorbing to you in those moments when you're going into it it has to be yeah. I think because if you want your reader to be equally absorbed uh, yeah. and I think I think the process of reading and writing are, are so close they're just two halves of the same mm. circle and um I, I had a. I, I've been blessed in my two of the editors I've had over my certainly over the last fifteen years. Um, one of them was well, they're both legends in their way. One of them was a really extraordinary one um, called Penelope Hall, who worked for Chateau for ages, and she was sort of my secret editor. She would um, edit books for me unofficially in exchange for a case of champagne or whatever. And, um, <laughs> but the, the, one, one of the best bits of advice she, she gave to me was so simple. She just said, remember the reader. Right. Always remember the reader. Um, and I do now. I always, I, I, I pull myself up short at certain points and think, what do I want the reader to feel at mm. this point? Um, and she would occasionally pull me up short after reading a first draft by saying, this chapter made me feel this. Is that what you wanted? Mm. Um, and it's so easy to get lost as a writer in your your own yeah. clever clogs, plans and things. Yeah. And what what Penny did was just to remind me actually this is this is the writing is about the reading yeah. at every stage, and and you'll always bear in mind what your reader knows, what they don't know. It's um, wonderful because that yeah. that really keeps you it, connected. Well, it sounds so obvious, but actually, it's amazingly easy yes, to forget. Absolutely, you, you know, you you tie yourself in knots sometimes. Just just like sometimes, I I find I need to remind myself just tell the story. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, just get on with it and tell the story. You you find yourself getting getting bogged down in these these kind of black holes of of narrative that don't have to be problematic, but you're mm. making them problematic by fretting about the style or the structure or mm. something. Um, Do you feel like you're becoming more skilled at, at noticing when you're you're doing that unnecessarily and how to pull yourself out? I, I think I'm getting better slowly <laughs> at knowing myself, yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've learned tricks over the years, uh, the ways of tricking myself and um, and things to beware of. I think one of the things I've learned to be really wary of is dialogue. Because mm. uh, time and again, dialogue can, writing dialogue can turn into this kind of elephant trap you fall into and you get stuck in these scenes that seem to go on and on and on. Mm. And it's because of the dialogue. Um, dialogue is the, I think, the single hardest thing any fiction writer mm. ever has to do. And it is, if you think about it, the slowest thing. Yeah. In any narrative, yeah. it creates this illusion of, of speed. You often hear student writers say, "Oh, I put all this dialogue in because I thought it would make it pacey." Actually, no, it moves at the snail pace of real life. Oh, um, that's so interesting. And but sometimes you, you can get trapped. I find, and you catch yourself just going on and on with some yeah. thing. And that's that's an instance where I've really learned from my screenwriting experience. There's this advice that's very hackneyed advice but really good advice to screenwriters which is to get in late and get out early so you you know what your scene involves you Mm. know what has to be achieved by it but you do not have to start with hello hello how are you today and you don't have to go right through to the end you can you can 
change gear and swoop in and actually you often only need on a novel uh, in a novel encounter and you're a scene in a novel you often only need one or two lines of the actual dialogue and the rest of it can just be recorded yes. speech or n- not even that oh gosh yeah. i remember i i did my masters up at bath spa and and i had faye weldon as a tutor and i remember her introducing reported speech to me and just kind of going through a piece that i'd written and doing it for me aloud just saying and <laughs> this whole page i would say and just saying two sentences where it was all and i was yeah. like that's mind-blowing thank you <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Really yeah, amazing. it is. But it, it it sounds obvious, but often it's not, you yeah. know, and, and um, I've, I've seen really exciting writing workshops around dialogue. I saw one where um, a couple of the students had to be actors. They had to get up and and talk to each other about oh, something. Wow. Um, you know, they planned it in advance and they just came in and did a scene, as yeah. it were. And then all the writing students had to do their version of what they'd just seen. Um, oh, wow. And of course, nobody can write fast enough to do every line of the dialogue. But it it really helped because it really showed that actually every encounter between two or three characters has a viewpoint. There's usually it's usually written from one viewpoint mm. for a start. Um, but also, the thing it really brings home is we're really bad at listening to each other. So, mm. well, I think a crucial mistake a lot of writers make with dialogue is to have it succeed. Most most conversations fail when you think about it because most of the time we're not listening to each other properly. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, right. we, we think we've heard the other person, yes. but we haven't really. I guess that um, brings it back to that, what you're trying to do, make, make things really um, real. <laughs> and, yeah, and so make the reader is re- uh, Yeah, the and, accuracy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. So how, do tell me, how long is your average <laughs> writing period to get, how long are you in that existential oh. deep, <laughs> deep pit? Well, my books <laughs> seem to take about three years in total. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, but that, that doesn't all involve writing. I think, I yeah. think usually it's about a year of what I think of as compost, which mm. is when... So I'm currently in the compost stage with my next novel. I know yeah. I know who the characters are, more or less. I know what the story is, more or less. And I am willfully not going to put anything down on paper for several months. I'm just get, I'm just feeding feeding it, feeding the compost heap, and I'll I'll That's let those thing. ideas mulch down. When I actually start to write, um, that usually takes about another year, I suppose. Right. Um, so I'm quite slow. I am quite slow, but I, it's partly because I get distracted by other projects quite mm. often. Um, I, I like that. I think a year sounds like <laughs> I get frightened <laughs> by the people that go, oh, I just sit down and knock it out in a few weeks oh, or months. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've learned to be really wary of those people. And I also, I'm also really, this is another great thing in favour of inky writing. When you do inky writing, when someone says to you, so what's your average word count? You can just look totally mm, blank and say, well, lovely. maybe maybe 10 words on a good day. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Because um, it, it's, yes. it's meaningless counting how many words you do. Yeah. And I think yeah. I also, I've, I've learned that, so the writer's block actually is a symptom of um, starting too soon. Mm. I, th- I, I think if you if you hurry the compost stage and feel you've got to get in there and get some words down and because you've read mm. some stupid American <laughs> book that says you've got to do your daily pages, <gasps> you, of course you freeze up because yeah. because you're not ready. You, you're you're, you're it, it's it's like a sort of yeah. you're almost aborting the characters because you, 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 they haven't you haven't let them form yet. I, I think I think it's really important to take your time and, and let it grow naturally. Um, and I try, I try not to start the actual writing until I can't bear not to. Right. So yeah, when I'm really ready, God, I'm ready, and I'm I'm you know getting really ratty because I'm not <laughs> able to get on with it. Um, if it feels as if I'm sitting down to invent stuff, that's a really bad sign. Right. Um, and I, I would avoid it like the plague. Uh, would you kind of keep a journal or notes or random jots during that composting time? I I do. I don't keep a journal. Um, but what I do do is I write 
in my, my I have these hardback notebooks and I write in them from two directions. So one, one, in one direction, it's what will become the finished prose of yeah. the novel. But if you flip the book over, the other side is where I put notes. Right. So all my books start with just the notes end of the notebook. That's and fantastic. that's where I grow characters. It's where I will jot down notes to self. I'll take notes from books or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I find that's really helpful as well, because if I'm having a bad day, once the book is underway, if I find I'm having a bad day or a bad week, I can just flip it over and go back to the notes yeah. and remind myself of the ideas I've maybe forgotten. Yes. That I had yeah, I, um, I think that's beautiful. Oh, gosh, what a lovely idea. And the composting period, that just feels so valuable to me and feels so easy to be forgotten. I've I've definitely been there myself. And, and I... Yeah, I mean, for me, really, in a way, the last year and a half has been a bit of that. And I've been starting to think, oh, God, nothing's coming out. And then it, it seemed like magic. All of a sudden, these things just start. It's almost like, well, that's a gross image. But the, the worms are really starting yeah. to work and it's moving yeah. and it's, yeah. Exactly. It takes on a life of its own. Yeah. And, um, yeah. No, I, 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 had, I had very good advice quite early on, which was to go away and read Jung because <laughs> mm. Jung is I mean there's a lot of nonsense in Jung and Freud but I think Jung is really good on the sources of creativity and right. listening to yourself and I, I, I taught myself there's a, a technique there's a little book you can get on a book's tiny book called a I think it's called a, a Jungian handbook of dreaming right. where you train yourself how you train yourself to remember your dreams um, which sounds incredibly solipsistic, but actually it's a really good discipline mm. because quite often you, you have amazing ideas in your sleep. <laughs> yes. And and if you get into this habit of holding your dreams in your conscious mind, you sort of it's almost like filing. You wake up and you move the dream across to the hard memory yes. where it will stay for a bit. Um, once you start working on a creative project, you find that in your dream life, you're still working and the compost mm. is really you know, shifting around. Um, oh, that's so interesting. But I think as a whole, that sort of process teaches you to listen to yourself and not push yourself. Yeah. I think, I think we're, we're getting terribly all too good at putting ourselves under pressure. And I don't think that's where creativity yeah. naturally comes from. Deadlines are a great thing. And sometimes these enforced structures are a really useful thing as well. Like being told, we want a short story from you, but it's got to be about some aspect of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Or it's got to be exactly <clears throat> 560 words long or something. That can be useful. But in terms of your daily writing, I think you know, pressure mm. is... Pressure never helps. <laughs> no, and I, I think it's it's interesting that most writers can be quite descriptive about creativity and, and I think it can be easily forgotten well, sometimes or some people might easily try and push that part aside and go straight to the, the work part. But actually it's just this real <laughs> fragile, ethereal and quite amazingly magical thing to play with that, that needs mm. a lot of nurturing and, yeah... Yes. And we all find our different ways of stimulating it. I mean, yes. some people listen to music, some people... I'm mean, going for walks really helps. I find my, my working days begin and end with a walk with the dogs. And it's mm. like a, a pressure chamber or a depressuring chamber coming out of the, book, the current work. And there's a, funny enough, there's a, book, there's a book coming out later this year about just this. It's a series of essays by wildly different writers about walking. And the centrality of going for walks in their, their working oh, life. Oh, that so is interesting. interesting. Oh, um, I'll have to get that. Wow. Because we are, you know, we all have, it's a very, it's the ultimate sedentary job, right? Yes. But it, sometimes I think it really helps to get away from the work. Yes. Um, yeah. Obviously it's in your head still, but just physically get away, get some oxygen in your lungs. And I find as I'm walking at the beginning of the day, I'm thinking about what I'm going to write. But that walk at the end of the day is also useful because it's where I will kind of think ahead to the next day yes. and, I don't know, assess. Um, yeah. yeah. 
I remember reading, um, I think it was Jay Griffiths that talks about the kind of etymology between wondering and wondering, the two, the two oh, wonderings yes. <laughs> and, and that kind of, yeah, how the, they do just join up. And I think you're right, there's space for both. There's the one where you can kind of digest the ideas or mull them around. And then there's the bit where you can actually move, get a bit of movement and move forwards and move away yeah. from. And yeah. Um, but you need to walk on your own. It's no good walking with another oh, person, especially if they're talkative. <laughs> what about your dogs? Are they distracting? Dogs are fine. <laughs> dogs are very good, sort of passive, quiet editors. They they, they do their own thing. But, uh, I think my, my dogs are quite used to me talking to myself <laughs> as well, which I do a lot. <laughs> That's fab. I was wondering as well about your garden, because that must take time from you. But is that part of the process of writing for you as well? Can that play a part? Oh God, it's just a wonderful displacement activity. And it's looking its looking like hell on earth at this time of year because um, it's so windy here. We get loads of detritus blows in and I just think there's no point tidying it up until we're past the March equinox and then right. I'll become a gardener again. But I do, I, it, it plays quite a good role. There, there are certain gardening tasks I love which are very, very repetitive like deadheading roses where you can do it with half a brain, snip, 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 and in your head you're thinking about a plot point oh, or lovely. something. Yeah, um, that's, re- that's really nice, isn't it, to have something that you can do with your hands. That, yeah, that can, ironing yeah. is good too, and making bread, similarly. They're, they're really good writerly activities because you're... You've got something to show for it. You've got a pile of beautifully ironed handkerchiefs or something, <laughs> or you've got a, a loaf of bread. But the actual process... Um, is one that allows you to suspend, you know, your hands can get on with it while your brain is elsewhere, which is lovely. Yeah. I like this a lot, actually, this thinking of ways that are helpful, but also that mean that you can satisfy it. Because something about writing to me is that fact that you don't have a finished product, as we've just talked about, for a long time. And yeah, it's hard to yeah. kind of show what all that work is. But like you say, to actually have as part of it, being able to produce those loaves of bread, those beautifully ironed hankies, those nice deadheaded <laughs> roses. It's lovely. I like that a lot. Um, I wonder as well when you, you've, so we've talked about place um, being an important starting point to you and, and the garden playing its place in your process of writing as well. But what, what, how does Cornwall play a part in all of this? Because you moved down here quite quickly, didn't you? Yes, I've spent most of my working life here. Um, it it does play a big part, but I, I don't make special claims for Cornwall mm. in that way. I, I think wherever I lived, the landscape would play a part. I'm, right. I'm just very open to landscape. The thing, the thing that's really special about Cornwall, especially West Cornwall, where I live, is simply that there are so many creative people down here. Yes. I mean, just up the road, I've got a, there's an amazing composer and a potter and a painter and, and you know, my other half is a sculptor. Yes. It, it, because there are so many of us creating, you never feel you need to apologise for the weird behaviour mm. that occasionally is necessary. Um, either the, the you know, deep unsociability yeah. or just the, you know, the, the fact that you've, you're not answering the phone. Um, yeah. People understand, which is lovely. But also, they they don't put you on a pedestal, which I think is something that's really unhealthy to be treated yes. as anything special. So I I love the fact that that you know, someone will be impressed with the fact you've written a novel, but they'll also be impressed with the fact that you've I don't know um, built a dry stone wall or something. Yes. It, it's yeah. it's just another kind of creativity. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. I I'd not really thought about that the importance of that empathy almost and, and that drawing the artist together as well of, of just, yeah, we live in the same way. We we can, yeah, hold each other up yeah. and also ground each other. And that's... that's yes, I mean, the, the the friend of ours is a, a, this amazing potter. He lives up the road. Um, I, I love the fact that occasionally he'll ring me or I'll ring him basically just to say, how's it going it's getting really badly. <laughs> oh yeah, it's really bad with me too. Anyway, it's just lovely to know. It's lovely to know he's there, yes. even if we're not seeing each other. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. In, in, sitting in our separate studios. And is that community uh, important to you in terms of writers? Because I know you 
do you head North Cornwall Book Festival or you? Yes, I, well, I, I start. I helped start it, and I'm, I'm, I'm I helped yes. start it at gosh, nearly ten years ago now, and I've tried to model it on all the best bits I've ever experienced at book festivals. Wow. Um, and okay, we're not hugely well funded, so we can't send the authors home with goodie bags of you know, local wine and cheese or whatever. Yeah. But um, I have always made it a cornerstone of it that the festival needs to be small enough for us to be able to have all the authors stay for the whole thing so that as well as the public getting something out of it, the authors get out Mm. of it the deep pleasure of meeting each other, hanging out together, going to each other's talks. Because Mm. you go to some of the really big, very commercial festivals, like, I don't know, Cheltenham or Edinburgh, and you do feel a bit like processed meat because there are so many authors to be got through and the programme is so big. Yeah. That yes, you you might get a really good audience and sell lots of books, but you've no sooner finished than they need you to leave because somebody else needs your hotel room. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, it, it's it's not. It's all about the the audience. It's not about feeding the authors. Yeah. And I think I think authors need those because we tend to work in isolation. I think it's really valuable to get to meet that other writers. That's and, so wonderful. You know, normalize each other by by realizing actually you've all got the same money worries or the same envies or whatever oh gosh it's so important um i'm really aware we're we're running out of time and there's so much more i could ask you but the hour has flown (laughs) (laughs) i'm really curious about so you've been in i want to know a bit more about mother's boy and you've been in cornwall you're so deeply grounded here and yet i've seen on your website that you were going here there and everywhere with this book now and and for over quite a few months, actually. And I, I know you've just said earlier that that also is part of getting to spend some time researching for the next book. But yeah, yeah. how is that for you, this part where you then go round the country and talk about oh, it? Oh, I book? love it. I, I feel I'm, with this book especially, I feel I'm, I'm a little bit like a preacher because I'm I'm spreading the word about Charles Causley because I am one of the patrons of the Charles yes. Causley Trust. So he's a subject, he's a writer dear to my heart. And and I love it when um, I start a talk and I do a quick straw poll of the audience and find that nobody has heard of Charles Causley. And mm. by the end, I check again, and lots of them are wanting to buy his poems. So um, oh, that's, that's very lovely. satisfying. Yeah. And and I just feel you know, he he's such an extraordinary writer, and his story is so moving, but also so mysterious. And it was one of those stories that um, I could only tell with fiction. Despite right. researching it like a biography, yeah. I knew there were going to be big emotional gaps in the story that I could only join with fiction. Yes. So. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. And and do you find it easy to go back into talking about it, even though it must have been a while now since you've actually finished that first? Book? I don't yet feel I've finished it. Um, <sighs> in fact, <laughs> only last night, a friend from orchestra who used to be in the Navy came up and said, oh, yes, I read your book. There are several things you got wrong, you know, and proceeded to give me details of things I got wrong <laughs> about the Navy. Um, <clears throat> so in a way, I'm still thinking of the text as a work in progress. Mm. And to my editor's horror, I'm going to be sending her an email with these these corrections in <laughs> so we can at least have it right for the paperback. <laughs> 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 That's the funny thing these days with digital publishing, because, yes, the book is in print. And you know, that print run has to sell out or begin to sell out before they'll print another print run. But with the e-edition that's going alongside it, I can make corrections overnight oh, and tomorrow. Wow. On everybody's Kindle, their version will be corrected. So um, oh, gosh, that's that kind of exciting. Inter- yeah, New that technology is exciting. Does have it. Yeah, it is exciting. And it, it's, it's nice to hear you caring about the story so much still. And I, I guess it helps that Charles Causley was close to your heart anyway. But the fact that you you still, yeah, you're still interested, you're still involved, it's still something that you care about. Yeah, no, I'm very involved. And I love the fact, especially when I'm talking in Cornwall, I, I, I've always had people in the audience coming up afterwards saying, Mr. Causley used to teach me in primary school, oh, wow. which is wonderful to meet, to get that direct yeah. connection. Um, and to be told that your version of him rings true, again, is, is hugely reassuring yes no that's wonderful um i will finish us off just i this is uh sometimes an easy question sometimes a hard question but what is your average 
writing day when you are in that pit of your really working away at the book? How how does that normally go? When it's going really well, um, it will start with a dog walk for about half an hour, 40 minutes. And then I will usually start by reading what I wrote the day before and then picking up my pen halfway through, making a few changes and corrections. And then it will, I hope, just flow on from there. I I usually, uh, <clears throat> I am a very male writer. I usually have a plan. I, mm. I rarely stick to it, but um, I find it helps break a the mountain of a novel down into bite-sized chunks which aren't quite so overwhelming to get yes. through and so I'll and I'll try to write uh, until about one one or two o'clock and usually I find my brain dips at that point yeah. and that's when I'll, I'll break for lunch and I usually spend the afternoon the kind of sleepier time um reading or answering emails or doing mm. admin. So actually, the actual writing day, I find naturally, is the morning. And then if I'm really lucky, if I'm somewhere where I'm not having to be sociable, I, I'll write again at night, which I love. But that's a rare that's a rare experience for me. I do occasionally treat myself and go away on a writing retreat. And when I do that, I will often write till very late at night because my brain really wakes up. If I can stay off the wine... My brain really wakes up. <laughs> if I've learned the hard way, if you if you drink and carry on writing, you think it's wonderful. And then you look in the morning, you think, "What is this pile of crap?" But, uh, <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience. It and was I, fun at the time. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. You, you also mentioned earlier that your your husband's a sculptor, and I, does he have a similar? Uh, working pattern to you because that is like you've mentioned uh, it's creative interesting work so you say that. No, his is subtly different because because he's also a working farmer and mm. there are often farming tasks that can't be denied you know the cattle at this time of year he has to feed the cattle first thing and so on so he will often start later but then work he works solidly through the afternoon when I'm having my sort of sleepy period right. I'll hear his hammer and chisel going away out in the barn <laughs> Um, what's quite nice is his his, the, his studio is in a barn just across the garden from where my writing shed is. So oh, if he's working funny. well, I can hear it and that spurs me on. Oh, that's really, that's so nice. Because that's something I really think a lot of us writers noticed the loss of during lockdown was that thing of sitting next to somebody, like being in a public space, being in a library and hearing other pens go or oh, whatever yes, the art yeah. is. Oh, Patrick, it's been so wonderful to talk. Thank you so oh, much. It's been a delight. <laughs> Thank you. And we look forward to, we've got you at our speakeasy coming up in the start of April. And yeah, Mother's Boy is out now. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Polly. We'll be back with another episode of the Writer's Block podcast and another inspiring conversation with a Cornwall-based writer. Click subscribe to hear when this episode is released and to help us share these conversations with others. You've been listening to the Writer's Block podcast. Find out more about the Writer's Block at thewritersblock.org.uk. Music and sound was by Jimmy Marshall from southwestsonic.com. Thank you for listening.